stick with me. Says she wanted jazz, it was hot and sweet. Oh, a little bit, so that's good. Well, welcome. I know John mentioned it, but if this is your first time here, we want to say welcome. My name is Dan, and we're glad you are hanging out with us. We are jumping in um, into a second week of a series we're calling Hope for All. Was anybody here last week? Um, great, awesome. Well, if you were here last week, you know that we started talking about these I am statements of Jesus, and we're going through the book of John. Now, I don't know if you're a, normally a church-going person, if this is your first time, if you grew up in church, um, or you've read much of the Bible today, but, um, or recently, uh, there's this book in the Bible called John, and uh, believe it or not, John was written by a guy named... Yeah, very nice. And I'm glad they kept it simple. <laughs> And John has a very interesting view on the life of Jesus because John is considered by most historians to um, the way the language of the Bible goes and even some historical documents of that time be one of Jesus' closest of close friends. As a matter of fact, John thought he was kind of like the most closest friend. If you read the book of John, it's got this really funny little statement in it that appears uh, several times. Now remember now, John's writing this and he's, he talks about this one disciple and it says, the disciple whom Jesus loved. Well, he's talking about himself, you know. So um, he, had, he apparently, at least he thought anyways, he might have been a little off, but he thought he had this amazing relationship with Jesus, a very, very close friend. And so John is not written like in real time necessarily. He didn't have this journal, and every time Jesus did something, he wrote it down. He probably did write some notes and keep some notes of some things, but it was years later, John sat down and began began to pen what we have in the Bible now called the book of John, remembering first meeting Jesus and remembering the miracles that happened um, when John was there and he was an eyewitness. So if you want a really unique view on who Jesus is, the life that Jesus lived, the book of John is a great place to start. If you're not a big Bible reader, which I know many of us may not be, you don't, you, it's hard to read sometimes, start in the book of John. I promise you you'll have a no, whole new perspective on the Bible, and John had a very intentional way of writing. As a matter of fact, here's what he says. Later in the book, he says, there's a reason I wrote this book, it was so that you would know that Jesus is the Messiah. In other words, I'm writing this so that you'll believe that Jesus is who he said he was. And we are taking just little pieces, impossible. We couldn't read the whole book here um, and dig into the whole thing. So we're taking pieces of it, and it's when Jesus proclaimed things about himself. Last week, we looked at Jesus said, I am the resurrection and the life. And we talked about him raising to life his friend, Lazarus. Many of you guys may know that story. Lazarus said, come out Lazarus and a dead man four days later rose again and we talked about how Jesus can bring life to areas that we thought were dead and gone not because Jesus is handing out hope or handing out life but because he is life and as we're talking about hope for all, here's what we really mean. So use this filter today as we talk, we jump in to the book of John again, is Jesus came to bring hope. That's forgiveness of sin. That's healing in our bodies. It's hope for all mankind, not just for us, but for all of mankind, but not just for all of mankind, for you as an individual person. Jesus came to bring hope, and his hope didn't go away just because he was buried and rose from the dead and he left earth. It, his hope didn't leave with him. His hope resides on the inside of every person that is named Jesus, the leader, the Lord of their lives. You are a carrier of hope. If you're a Christian, you're a carrier of God's hope because he lives in you. That's good news. That, here's what that means. That hope is not out there somewhere. Hope lives in you in the person of Jesus Christ. And so we're going to jump to John chapter 15. Now if you've got your Bible, great. If you don't have your Bible, um, we, uh, we printed them all right here in the blue program. So you can grab that if you want to. And we're going to look at a few verses out of the book of John where Jesus throws out this I am statement again. And this I am statement is a really controversial statement. Now to you and I, not that controversial, but let me just set this up real quick. 
a few thousand years before Jesus was on the earth, you may have heard there was a man who walked the earth named Moses. And Moses got handpicked to lead the Israelites out of slavery and into the promised land away from the Egyptians. So God asked Moses, hey Moses, I want you to do it. He's standing there in front of this burning bush. You guys may have remembered the story from Sunday school. The burning bush. And God says, you're the guy, Moses. And Moses says, no, I'm not. <laughs> he chickened out. Moses was like, this is too big of a response. That's a pretty big responsibility. It's estimated. Now, you guys may have seen movies. Remember the Ten Commandments with Charles? and Heston, right? All these people walking out. I don't know how many extras they use in that movie, but it's estimated by a lot of historians that about three million people made up the nation of Israel, and that means Moses was now in charge of an estimated about three million people. It's a lot of responsibility, you know what I mean? And so he's kind of like, lead all these people? No way, I'm not a very good speaker. God cures all that and talks him into doing it, you know, has to kind of twist his arm a little bit. And then Moses says, well, who, when they ask me, who, who sent you? What am I supposed to say? Remember what God said? He said, tell them, I am sent you. God was saying who he was, I am. So fast forward to Jesus. Jesus is saying, I am the resurrection and the life. He said those same two words that God used in Moses, and it freaked people out. They flipped out. You're calling yourself the I am, and Jesus was saying, yes, I am. I am the God that you've been worshiping, worshiping in flesh and blood. I'm here. Follow me, and in me there is life. So to us, we just read over it. Well, I'm the resurrection life, but it was a very controversial thing to say. We're going to pick it up in John 15. It's right there in your blue program. And if you don't have a program, just shoot up your hand. We'll get you one. Here's what he says. I am the grape vine. My father's the gardener. He cuts off every branch of mine that does not produce fruit. So here's what I do know. I'm not a grape guy. I don't know a lot about it. I do know that if you're not producing fruit, they prune you off, right? So that the other ones can. He goes on to say it. And he prunes the branches that bear fruit so that they will produce even more. You have already been pruned and purified. He's talking to his disciples by the message I have given you. Chapter 15, verse 4. Remain in me. It's a great word. Remain in me, and I will remain in you. For a branch cannot produce fruit if it's severed from the vine. That's kind of common sense, right? And you cannot bear fruit unless you remain in me. Yes, I am the vine, and you are the branches. Those who remain in me, and I in them, will produce much fruit. When you produce much fruit, you are my disciples. This brings great glory to my father. Now I want to tell you about my car. And when I first got married, how many of you guys ever had a car you wish you actually, looking back, you wish you never had that car? You know what I'm talking about? Have you guys ever had a car held together by mostly duct tape? Yeah? No? Two people nodding their heads. How many guys? Anybody? Well, I did. I remember, thank you, Donna. I remember um, right getting married, I had this really sweet uh, black leather Mustang convertible, and I sold it to take my wife on a great honeymoon, you know? <laughs> And so I had some money left over, and I bought this just, it was bad. It was a, it was a two-door red Pontiac something. El Crapo, is, I think is what the actual official title was. But anyways, so um, this vehicle, at first, I bought it from my buddy, <laughs> my buddy. Um, and at first, it had like um, this little funky odor going on in it. I thought, man, this car, it smells weird. Well, maybe he just smells, you know. So I figured I spray enough Febreze all over that thing. I air it out and it would be good. I would, it would get better for like a week. You know what I mean? And then that stuff wears out and then it would get this weird funk again. And I noticed it was getting a really weird funky smell right after like a, a storm. I thought, what is going on with this car? I didn't think much of it. Found out later there was a, like a really weird um, uh, leak 
and it was coming all the way down and soaking my baseboards, rotting them out. I was smelling mold every couple weeks, and I'm just pouring <laughs> gallons of Febreze over it. If, at first, you about die from the Febreze smell, but then after a while, it smelled a little bit better. So it got better, but eventually I'd have to do it again, and have to do it again, and then I'd have to do it again. Well, after driving it for a little while, here's what started happening. Now, I, at the time, I was living in Tulsa, Oklahoma, which the weather is a little bit like it is here in the summer, where it's extremely hot and extremely humid. It was about 110 degrees outside the first time this happened. It was hot, about 80% humidity. Man, I'm sweating. I'm in my wife. I'm thinking, I'm so sorry, babe. I know this is not what you signed up for, marrying me, you know. We're driving, and we stop at the stoplight, and all of a sudden, my gauge, the engine temperature gauge, starts going through the roof. I thought, oh, man, this car's about to blow up. So I pull over. Luckily, there's like this AutoZone O'Reilly's place over here. They come to take a look at, oh, you need a new thermostat. I put a new one in. Oh, and it was better. But it kept blowing thermostats. So about every week or two in the summer, I'd have to get a new one. And it was better for a while. It got better. And then it'd be hot again. We're sitting at this stoplight. Boom, here goes the heat. So I'd have to turn the air conditioner off just to drive around. It's a hot, oh, man, you know, you can't, windows, rolling windows down don't help humidity at all. It was brutal. And then we had to run the heat, if it got real bad, to cool it off. My head's out the window, you know. It was terrible. It was terrible. It would get better when I fixed it, but then, after a while, I'd have to fix it again. Well, I'm driving down the road, and I hit this speed bump, like one of those school bumps, you know. And after I hit it, I just hear... I thought, what? Could, I'm not a mechanic. What could possibly? I think my engine's about to blow up. I'm getting all nervous. I look behind. I see sparks flying. My muffler's dragging on the ground. Well, I was at a spot in my life where I didn't have enough money to get a new one. So I went and bought some tie wire. I got up under there, and I tie-wired that muffler up. Any of you guys have to do that before? I tie-wired it up. It's, it was better. It was hanging a little bit. It was better, but it was off the ground. At least it wasn't sparks. I didn't catch nothing on fire, you know? So I'm driving that for a while. I love the winter times because the heat worked great, you know? And winter in Oklahoma lasts about as long as it does here, so it wasn't very long. But what I didn't realize is a hole got punctured in that muffler when that thing hit, so this thing's smoking out. It's brutal. This car, no matter what I did to make it better, something else would bust on it. You know what I mean? I didn't have enough to buy a new car, so I'd just be fixing little things all the time. I'm, I'm not no mechanic. I am no mechanic at all. Eventually, the water pump went out. Eventually, the power steering. I mean, it was the never-ending car of problems, right? And, uh, and so I could not wait to get a new one. And right about the time I was about to get a new one, I get a call from my buddy. He's getting married. Can you come up to the wedding? My car ain't going to make it up to Minnesota from Oklahoma. That's where I was born and raised. And without it breaking down on the way. So we rented a car. And this car, I, it had roll up and roll down windows, no power, nothing. But it was like driving the greatest car I'd ever been in in my life. It was like brand new. It was like at 800 miles on it. I got in it. It didn't smell all funky, you know, and it smelled like a new car, that new car smell. <clears throat> I, the air conditioner blew. <laughs> it was the middle of the summer. I was cold driving. It was great. There was nothing dragging on the bottom. There was no duct tape, no tie wire, nothing on it at all. It was new and it was great, right? Jesus paints us a picture by showing us, he's talking about these vines and all this stuff, right? He's saying, if you, if you get connected to me, your life is new. It's a whole new life. If you try to live apart from me, you could probably make some stuff better, but it's not new. And a lot of the things that we walk through in life, a lot of the problems that we face, you know what we really want? We just want it to be better. Have you ever faced something you're like, it'd be so great if this in my life, if my marriage was just better, I'm not even asking for perfect, just better, it would be great. If my financial situation was just better, I'm not asking for $10 million, but it'd be great if it was just better. I wish my relationship with my kids was just better. It doesn't have to be perfect. I don't have to be super mom or super dad, but if it was just better, if I could control my temper, just a little bit better. If I was a, such a negative person and I was my, my positivity was just a little bit better, 
it would all be better. Now, here's a problem with better. Just like with my car, better is good. Listen, I want to have better everything too. I want my marriage to be even better and stronger than it is today. And I want my attitude to be better, my character and my integrity. I always want it to be better. But do you know what the truth is? Better is never good enough. And just like my car, it's better for a while, but then you crash and burn, and you're like, oh, man. You end up saying those little Hail Mary prayers, man. They're like, Lord, I just freaked out on my spouse. I just yelled at my kid. I just, you know, um, threw a tantrum at the office. Um, I, I had my, my temper was good. It was, it was going so good for a while. It was so much better, but then I exploded again, and I need your help. And oftentimes when we have a better relationship, that relationship with God, that, God, can you help this? thing get better here's what we tend to do we tend to only come to God when we want things to be better and so if our relationship's based on man I need a better life I better go to church and I better get Jesus in my life because this thing ain't going so good when we start our relationship just wanting God to give us a better life for us then what we tend to do is only come back to him when things aren't good and we want it to be better. So when things are going really good, we don't really need God, do we? Because nothing needs to be better. I haven't blown up lately, freaked out on anybody. The finances are pretty good, right? My spouse and I are getting along. My significant other and I haven't fought in a couple months. I haven't needed God in a couple months. Well, then something happens. We need it to get better. We run to the God who's just supposed to make everything better. And that, Jesus is saying through this, that listen, there is that type of life and God's not going to reject you and turn you aside and strike you down with some lightning bolt. You only come to me when you're asking for stuff because he loves you and he wants you to come to him. But what he really wants is just like a branch connected to a vine for you to remain connected to him. Jesus did not suffer and die, go through persecution and pain so he can band-aid and duct tape and tie wire your life back together. Jesus did not come to give you a better life. He came to give us a brand new life. There's a huge difference between better and new, right? Huge difference. I sat in that new car. I thought, this is amazing. Now, the car, was it perfect? No, it wasn't some... Uh, there's, if I were to pick out a car, that would have been the car I picked. It was a little red two-door rental with, you know, you got to roll up the... <laughs> You're talking to people doing this stuff, popping. You got to actually use a key instead of a clicker to get in your car, you know? It wasn't perfect. It wasn't like, oh, blow my mind, but it was new. It was new. Jesus had not come to make our lives just better. And so what we often do is when we want better, we try to hold on to the life that we lived before Jesus Christ, before his forgiveness of sins, before we accepted him as leader, before we became a Christian. We try to hang on to that life and that character and that attitude and that perspective. And then we also want this new life Jesus wanted. So we end up in this tug of war between this new life Jesus wants for us and this old life that we kind of like. And we get pulled and those two lives can't coexist. They were never meant to coexist. Jesus came to give us a whole new life. How does that look? Well, here's how it looks. Jesus said this in what we just read. He's the vine. And those branches that are connected to him will produce fruit. In other words, there will start to be, you will notice people, without even trying, their lives start to look different. You ever met someone that acted a certain way, talked a certain way, and then they say they became a Christian, or they started going to church, they got religion in their lives, right? Or whatever, whatever words they say. And it's like, whoa, man, this person's like a different person. You know what that is? That's a new life that's on the inside of them. Now it's coming out. New life that's in them is now coming out. If you 
are a follower of Jesus. If you've said, Jesus, I've made a bunch of mistakes. I need you to forgive my sins. I invite you to come in and take over. I want you to be my leader. Implanted in you, the moment that happens is new life and hope. And all that's remaining is for you to allow it to come out. I heard a guy say it like this one. Have you ever seen an, a lemon tree like really work really hard to try to produce lemons? No, it just naturally happens because it's in them. But oftentimes you want to hang on to our old lives, who we used to be before we met Jesus. The greatest challenge of a Christ follower is to allow Jesus to live through them. Not to work so hard to, oh, I've got to work, 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 and strive, strive, strive. Does Jesus want us to live like he lived? Yes. Absolutely. The book that Jesus gave us is an example of how we should live. But it wasn't intended to be something that you have to labor over. It, no. Jesus, the true life of God is in you and it can come out of you. That's what it means to produce fruit. Now there's this great verse in your Bible. It's in our program. And here's what it says. Galatians 2.20 My old self has been crucified with Christ. It's no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. There it is right there. Yeah, I mean, obviously I'm here, but Christ is living in me. So I live in this earthly body by trusting in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Let's jump down to John 15. It's the last verse in your program because Jesus will echo exactly what Paul just said. I have loved you even as the Father has loved me. Remain in my love. When you obey my commandments, you remain in my love just as I obey my Father's commandments and remain in his love. I have told you these things that you will be filled Filled with joy. Yes, your joy will overflow. This is my commandment. Love each other in the same way I have loved you. Jesus kind of throws this unbelievable, these two things out at us and say, hey, let me, let me show you what fruit looks like. Now, I have met some people in my life that have been following Jesus longer than I've been alive. I'm about to be 37. And I know people that have been following Jesus longer than I've been alive. Or at least they would say that they're Christ followers, they're Christians. Have you ever been around someone that's been in church or they've been religious for like a really, really long time, but it does not seem that their life is marked by joy and love? Have you ever met someone like that before? And then also, have you ever met someone that's like new to this whole God thing? And church is kind of brand new to them. And it seems like they're overflowing with love and with joy. Yeah, that's because all of us are filled with the love and the joy that Jesus is talking about right here. But many of us don't allow that fruit to come flying out of our lives. It's not the mark of who we are. And oftentimes it comes down to one reason. Why do we often not produce fruit in our lives? Why are we often kind of going back and forth in this life, this old life and this new life? Jesus says this, remain in my love. I am convinced in the young life that I've lived in 15 years of being a pastor is that most people are not convinced on how much they are loved by God. I'm convinced. And I'm, what I'm not talking about is like, yeah, I get it. I'm, I know John 3, 16, God loves me. No, no. I get that you may know that. I'm talking about how convinced are you? Now listen to this statement I'm about to make. How convinced are you that there is nothing you could ever, ever do to make God love you less? There is nothing you could ever do to make God love you less. And there's nothing you could ever do to make God love you more. We love to rate, right? Like, oh man, look at that lady. She, God must really love her and bless her. No, no. God's love cannot go up and down based on us. If that was the case, <laughs> we're all in trouble, man. On our good days, God loves us a lot. But on our bad days, God's love's kind of waning, you know? It's kind of rocky. I'm not sure about this whole thing. No, God loves for you is perfect. There's nothing you could do to earn more of God's love. And there's nothing you could do to make God love you less. You are the apple of God's eye. You, I heard a guy say it like this. If God had a refrigerator, your picture 
would be on it. <laughs> That's pretty good, right? Because he obsesses over you. He's thinking about you. And his love for you is perfect. If, his, if we really understood with what the great capacity that God loves us, then that love that's in us would have to come out. I'm convinced there's no way you could bottle up that kind of love and that kind of joy and that kind of peace. And so how is it that we are able to obey? He says to obey, obey our com his commandments. How is it we're able to turn the other cheek? How is it we're able to love our enemy and to serve our neighbor? How is it possible? Just by sheer will, no way. Impossible. But living in response to that great love. We produce fruit when we realize the greatness of God in us and want to get it out. You can, unlike a grape, a grape can never sever itself from the grapevine. You know what I mean? It's either on or it's not on, and maybe the, the, the ground or how the, um, the, the gardener comes and messes with those vines. I'm not a gardener, so I don't know exactly what they do. But that grape is kind of determined by that. Well, our gardener says in John is God, our Father, and Jesus is the vine. Those things will never fail. But unlike a pumpkin, you know, it's pumpkin season, someone has to come along and cut that pumpkin off. And then we're severed, we're disconnected. That's our choice. God now leaves that up to us. You can remain connected to Jesus and allow his life and his light and his peace and his joy and his spirit to come in you and then a response come out of you. Or you can say, God, I would just rather have the kind of relationship with you so that you can fix me when I'm broken. And God will never grab your ear, twist it, grab your arm, and force you into doing either one because he loves you too much. He's not a dictator. He's not forcing you to do anything. Instead, he's calling us to stay connected to him. He's asking us, allow my life and my joy and my peace to come in you instead of just band-aiding what everyone sees. I remember the day I got rid of that old junker. <laughs> it was like the greatest day of my life. And I got this newer car. And it ran great. And I've got, now I've got five kids and my air conditioner works. It's beautiful, right? Especially here. And there's nothing dragging underneath, you know? I could have kept bandaging that car up until it just no longer ran. And it would have been fine, but listen, better isn't the point. New life is what Jesus wants to bring us. He doesn't, he doesn't want to band-aid our outside. He wants to give us love and joy and peace inside. We produce fruits when we're, when we're full of who God is, and then it starts to come out.